Hello, Tungsten Miner here. I thought this time I would talk about a uh, vanilla construct, although I've uh, added a bit to it from Immersive Engineering, called a mob spawner or mob grinder. Uh, they're kind of uh, two pieces of the same device, really. The whole point of this thing is that if you need to get some of the drops from vanilla mobs, so you need zombie flesh, or you need string, or you need uh, bones from skeletons, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if you need to get that stuff in high amounts, it's uh, kind of tricky and challenging and dangerous to go after the mobs yourself. So you build something that allows you to cause the mobs to spawn somewhere safe, and then you go and collect uh, well, you, you get some way to get them to spawn somewhere safe, and then you get some way to kill them such that their drops don't get destroyed, and then you just go, well, collect all the drops. And as you can see, I've got a pretty good volume of critters dropping down and getting killed. And of course they're getting killed because they're falling so far that they wind up dying when they hit the ground. All right, here we are. So as you can see, uh, this is actually working pretty well here. <laughs> and I've got a pretty good volume of uh, mobs spawning and dropping down here. And, um, you know, occasionally things will miss, but uh, by and large it works as you'd expect it to. So let me talk about how this is put together and the mechanics of what's going on. Uh, first and foremost, you need a place for the mobs to spawn. And as you can see, I've got them spawning way up above. Because down here, I've uh, used some of these glowstone strips that I'm so fond of to add uh, enough light where mobs generally don't spawn down here. There's a couple of spaces that aren't quite lit up enough. But you have to remember the Minecraft mechanism for spawning monsters, which is they never spawn too close to the player, nor do they spawn too far away from the player. And in fact, if a mob is too far away from the player, they won't spawn at all. Uh, they won't, they'll, they'll actually get despawned automatically. Let me get rid of some of this junk here. All right, so there's still a lot of mobs up there. We can still take a peek. But uh, if I head up carefully, I can get straight up to the top without getting attacked too badly here. Okay, so on the inside here, yeah. now that I'm up here, they will stop spawning because I'm too close. Um... On the inside, I've got a solid ceiling, so that prevents any light getting in. I've got solid walls, so no micro blocks here. Uh, likewise, preventing light from getting in. So as you can see, I've got my F7 uh, NEI feature turned on. All of these are capable of spawning monsters. But in no place do I have more than three meters to go for a mob to wind up getting onto one of these conveyor belts. And the conveyor belts are so arranged as to lead one to the other to bring you back to this hole. Now, I have a jetpack, of course, so I don't fall down the hole. But the mobs don't. So all of these layers are built on the same design and uh, with the same pattern. They're all three meters tall so that endermen can spawn inside of here. And what will wind up happening is the mob will spawn, it'll wander around a bit, and eventually it'll walk into one of these conveyor belts. And like I did, it kind of gets stuck, right? If I'm pushing, if I'm pressing my W key, I'm very slowly kind of working my way off. But mobs don't have the ability to really fight this. They'll just kind of get pushed along. And eventually they'll just drop. And we can hear the mobs down below kind of hissing and sputtering. And I've calibrated this so that that bottommost layer, right down there, that, that last one, the distance between this floor and this floor down here is precisely 24 meters, which is enough distance to cause fatal fall damage for all mobs except Endermen, who are twice as strong as the rest of them. So it won't kill them, but it will kill anything else. And once they hit the ground, fatally wounded, they will die and drop whatever they drop. And the conveyor belts will pull it all into the middle and drop it into this chest. And so here, in the course of just a few minutes, I've gotten 
the better part of a stack of most of the kinds of mobs drops that you might want to find. Okay, so that's the mechanics of getting the mobs to die. But of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, you can see here I've got a matter receiver, which uh, gives me the ability to teleport here from my home base. And uh, the other factor is that mobs tend to spawn in kind of a sweet spot where they're not too close but not too far away. So if you just stand in one spot, it reduces the total amount of area which is in that sweet spot between too close and too far away. Um, so if you jump on this conveyor belt, it's going to start taking you around. It's going to get you closer so that the topmost layers are within that sweet spot and then further away so that the bottom most layers are in that sweet spot. See, I've got my friend over here. So you even can get ender pearls if you're careful, uh, although you kind of have to be paying attention to get them. Because uh, then you have to rush up and kill those guys, and they don't always drop them. But, of course, endermen are really darn hard to come by in the overworld. Um, and they're very hard to catch. And they're actually kind of dangerous. So, between all of these different things, it's actually really nice to have uh, a trap for endermen that makes it uh, a bit easier to get those ender pearls, at least enough of them, to make your way to the end for the first time. Uh, Gunpowder, that's the other one. Um, so as you can see, as I'm going up and down here, I'm both going closer and further to the floors, and I'm also moving closer and further to each of the corners up there. And that makes it so that uh, the mobs spawn a little more rapidly because I'm touching all of the zones and moving them all into that sweet spot for mob spawning. Uh, because of course I need them to sp not only spawn, which is a bit easier, but I need them to move. And if you're too far away, the mobs will be there, but they won't actually move it around at all, which means they won't get on the conveyor belts and therefore won't get pushed off the edge. So this particular design sort of requires them to be, be able to move of their own accord. And there are other ways of arranging this. And I'm sure if you look online for mob spawner, mob grinder, you'll find lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different designs. This is just the one I happen to make. Another thing to point out, I did this out in the ocean for a very specific reason. Um, I don't want mobs spawning anywhere except in the trap, because of course another part of the mob spawning algorithm is that you can only have so many mobs active at a time. And once all of those spots are filled up, even if those mobs are you know, away from you and not going to be useful, at least not in the case of a mob spawner, um, they are taking up one of those positions. So every mob that spawns outside of your trap is one less mob that can spawn inside of it. So it's kind of handy to make sure you're in a place where you can prevent mobs spawning anywhere else. So there's no solid ground for them to spawn on. And before I set this up, I dug a bunch of um, tunnels, you know, wells basically straight down and went and made sure there was no big cave systems or anything under the ocean down there. Um, so I'm standing at Y level 83 right now. The water's at Y level 64. Uh, the gravel is at Y level 48-ish, you know, something like that. And so I didn't have all that far to dig down to make sure there weren't any caves, and there aren't. Um, if there were, I would have just let the water leak into them, and that would have prevented mobs spawning in there. So looking at the design a little bit, I wanted this to be... Uh, at least as realistic as reasonably could be. So um, I made some big pillars. I had them kind of taper into other pillars. I've got uh, kind of a solid platform that's on top of those. We switch to brick. As we come up, we switch back to dacite. I've got some micro blocks on the outside, really as just decorative elements, because you really do need the solid blocks to keep the light from getting in. Otherwise, uh, your mob spawner only works at nighttime. And uh, since I'm doing dangerous mob spawning kinds of things, I figured I'd get some nether bricks there too. Um, I have this mostly lit up. Uh, I could be a little bit more particular about getting it lit the rest of the way and preventing any mobs from spawning up here. But I actually haven't had a lot of problems with it. Um, there's so many more target areas for mobs to spawn inside the trap that I haven't really found I'm losing much to having mobs spawn up here. Uh, if it were a problem, I could just add some more lanterns or torches or something and uh, prevent the even these areas from being target areas. And that's it. That's the whole mob spawner. Um, 
usually a, a fairly early game construct, uh, not something you need uh, once you get later on in the game because it's just easier to come by those materials uh, or you've already collected a whole bunch of them. But uh, I figured I'd talk about this because it's actually kind of cool. Okay, after that short break, uh, I wanted to come back and talk about some progress on the house. So as you can see, I've put in a line of ash trees on the left here. And what I've really been working on is um, getting the grounds straightened out. Now you've seen how I've put in a lot of these retaining walls and fences and things. But uh, I've been spending a lot of time getting the gardens and things in place. So the first thing to notice is I've now got this gravel walk that goes around and follows the kind of middle layer here. Oh, look at that. Uh, I've got these uh, paduk, paduak, I'm not sure how they're pronounced, trees that uh, make up this front lawn area. And I haven't quite decided what else I'm going to do here. Maybe nothing, and uh, maybe just leave it as lawn. But I was thinking of trying to find some interesting ground cover trees that you might find in the real world in a very shady sort of spot uh, and fill this area in a bit more. I haven't decided what to do with this little strip here. Again, maybe nothing. The pathway follows its way along here to this little uh, cherry garden. So hydrangeas and pyramid cedars in little planter boxes. Uh, a combination of... Um, Red begonias, and I forget what these are now. Uh, can I just break them and find out? Yeah, okay. That's a Astoria daisy. There you go. And uh, deep red begonias with cherry trees in the same kind of planter boxes. I use the same planter boxes all the way around. Um, yeah, so nice little kind of lawn area here. Uh, I have no idea even how to pronounce that, but uh, interesting tropical looking plants. <laughs> uh, some ferns and uh, orange begonias, orange nemesia, and a swimming pool. Uh, so this was a little bit of work to get in. Lots of marble. Um, the gray kind of stripes to make up the swim lanes is soapstone combined with marble. So you get the off-white, you know, very light gray sort of soapstone with the very bright white marble. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff here from Deco Craft. So a Wasili chair, which actually you can sit in like a real chair. And uh, glass tables is a place to put your drink. A uh, little toy boat, which is also from Deco Craft. Uh, you can kind of see at the bottom I've put in what is basically just chisel styled glowstone to light up the bottom of the pool. So you can actually see all the way to the bottom and get that neat effect. These are the same kind of fluorescent lights that I've put in elsewhere, which of course when it gets dark means that the pool area is lit up a little bit and actually looks really nice. Uh, this is a kid's slide from Deco Craft, which I've placed as a uh, slide into the deep end of the pool and a deco craft telescope to be able to look out across the broad horizons here or off into the sky. Following the path around, that gets me to this uh, this little garden here, which is uh, sweet chestnut, some cylindrical cedar and hummingbird bush, along with just a nice bench to look out and enjoy the view. Uh, the ground cover is just green leaves and twigs taken from some nearby boreal forests. So this is kind of the boreal garden. Over here, I've got the red maple garden. So more hummingbird bushes, more pyramid cedars, a picnic table, uh, some uh, bright red begonias instead of the dark red ones, and some fern in the back. And just kind of a nice lawn area in the side here. Coming around this side of the house, I've got a horseshoe pit. Uh, my dad and I used to play horseshoes when I was a kid. And I remember really, really enjoying it, and it brings back fond memories. So uh, this is actually a uh, tin block cut down to the longest strip size with uh, some planks and strips and nooks of hickory making up the borders to the boxes and just plain sand in the bottoms of the boxes. And uh, I looked up the regulation rules, and according to uh, Horseshoes, the two uh, Pits should be 40 feet apart, which comes out to 13 and a third meters approximately. So I counted off 13 meters and uh, put in the other side, 
with just all the same matching materials and construction. And then that gives me this front lawn area, which I haven't quite decided what to do with either. Um, and that brings us back around to the front of the house. After a long walk, it's a big one. <laughs> And upstairs and through the front door. Uh, I think this is pretty much the same. I've been using these Barcelona chairs for a while now. Haven't really mentioned them. Jukebox in the corner there. And uh, move the TARDIS over to this corner. Uh, this is largely the same, I think, uh, except for this down the corner. I've actually added in some fluorescent lighting here uh, because during night it gets dark enough where it's hard to see what's in the different chests. Uh, I moved the trim from being above to being below so that you could get a good view of this elevator, uh, actually teleporter. So this block, this elevator block, comes from, uh, I think it's open blocks. Uh, yeah, open blocks. Uh, and the way it works, uh, we'll start with the recipe, I guess. The recipe is just any color wool around an ender pearl, and you get the different color ones, I think, just by crafting them with some die, I'm pretty sure. Um, but once you've got them, if you stand on them and jump, just jump, it searches upwards to find another elevator block above you, and then just teleports you to the top of that elevator block. And if you crouch, it searches downwards for the next elevator block down and teleports you there. So while it says it's an elevator, it's not an elevator at all in the way that the Nematocraft elevator is an elevator. It's really just a teleporter. These blocks up here are Futura circuit blocks, uh, which have a recipe from uh, Chisel. Futura, and that's this guy. So you take stone and stone brick with redstone in the middle, and that gives you back eight of these Futura blocks. And then uh, running them through chisel, you can get uh, all sorts of crazy futuristic-ish looking patterns. And so I went ahead and grabbed, I think this one here, just the white circuit pattern. So that, and then covered it with uh, covers of white stained glass to mute that effect just a little bit. And these are just andesite strips, the same sort of andesite that I use as the, uh, the edging around the side of the building over there and kind of see it down there. So I can come over here and have this fancy teleporter elevator thing. Because as I was going up and down and doing lots of different things with this stuff up here and down here and up here and down here, going up and around the stairs or even using the Pneumatocraft elevator started feeling inconvenient if I happen to be way at this end of the room. So here's yet another solution for getting up and down to different floors of your house. In here, I have got a lot more of the machines installed. So I've brought over a lot of the machinery from my other house. Here's the same Galacticraft stuff. Uh, I think I had all this in here before, all the Buildcraft stuff. I've moved over all the machines now from my thermal expansion stuff. And, you know, I'm able to spread them out a little bit more. It doesn't feel quite so cramped because this whole floor is kind of a powered machines room as compared to having just the one small room in the other place. Over here, I've got all of my uh, carpentry machines. So this is kind of an interesting set of uh, things because the bottom machines are all carpenters. But carpenters work with three different kinds of fluids to make the various items that you wind up making in them. And uh, two of them use fluids that are a little bit hard to come by, right? So honey is something you have to get by squeezing these honey drops that you can only get by having uh, centrifuged honeycombs. This one works on seed oil, which you can only get by pressing various kinds of plants that produce seed oil. And you now there's not a ton of them that do that. Uh, so let's see, yeah, seed, you know, daisies and not mangoes, that gives you fruit juice. Uh, anyway, yeah, lots of different kinds of seeds that will give you uh, seed oil. But a lot of the ones that come off of trees are your best ones. So here's butternut, for example, gives you 180 millibuckets of seed oil as compared to a tea seed, which gives you five. <laughs> so using plant seeds is not at all where you want to get a lot of your seed oil from. Uh, and this allows you to make, um, uh, I can't get a, 
any idea to show me that. But this allows you to make all, a lot of the wooden parts, the impregnated sticks and impregnated gears and so on and so on that you need for a lot of the carpentry machines. And the honey stuff allows you to make the scented panels and the scented this and the scented that that you need for a lot of the forestry stuff. So this allows, this is kind of my forestry uh, wet wetware room. As I keep working and add more of the forestry stuff, I'll wind up putting it in here as well. So I've saved some room for that. Uh, finally, this is the carpenter that I use for doing water. And uh, that's because I finally hooked up this water pipe that leads all the way back into that wall and uh, goes over to the waterworks that I've got at the far end of the building. So I'll, I'll take a walk over there and show that too. This is the unpowered machines room, which uh, is still quite small, but uh, that's kind of all I need. I don't have a lot of unpowered machines. Uh, yeah, And then the chalkboards over here. So taking a little walk down to the bottom floor and show how all that's hooked up. Okay, so here we are in the main foyer, right? So I'm standing basically in front of the main front door. And uh, back behind me here is now, now I'm under that big staircase. And uh, I've got this water pipe that's coming in from off to the side. And it winds up just going up this wall until it gets to the powered machines room. So looking at this on a map, here's the front foyer area. And here's the front patio and door. So the water starts way over here, goes along a pipe, follows its way up to here, and then goes up the wall here, coming along to this room, which is the carpentry room. So that's the carpenter that gets water right there. Uh, yeah, so let's follow this trail backwards a bit. That comes through here. I've changed how the facades work a little bit because I didn't like it how it looked going straight under the cover like that. So I made a bunch of these hollow covers, uh, and the recipe for these guys is um, you just take the regular facade and put it back on the assembly table, and with a teeny tiny amount of power, it'll convert it into a hollow facade. So if I were to put a facade down right here that's not a hollow facade, you see how it breaks the connection between the two adjacent pipes? It's a way to actually separate pipes if that's what you're trying to accomplish. But of course, I don't want to cut off the water supply. So I take that one off and see how it reconnects. And now I take this hollow facade and pop it on there. And, uh, oops, you see, I put it in the wrong spot. So you see how this one is slightly jutting out. So I'm going to right click, shift right click with an open hand and then aim a little bit further in. And there, now it's lining up directly underneath. So you can get very subtle with the placement of these things. But now it looks like it goes into a solid block of red granite. And I've gone around to all the different sides of things. And, uh, you know, I did it there. I did it over here. Uh, just to make things look a little nicer. Um, I'm probably the only person on the planet who would know or care. But, hey, it's my world. I can do what I want. Following this all the way back. We go back onto the floor here. We come out. goes around the corner. And that brings us back to my water room. So my cistern here is made up of now three aqueous accumulators. I was finding that the engines were running dry um, when they got going, so added another one. That seems to have solved it. And I extended the pipe, of course, down into this floor to go share with all the rest. Checking in on the engines up here. <coughs> Everything's going pretty well. Uh, this box is full. I've got as much of all these materials as I can need. And I've got fuel backed up all the way into the stills themselves. The stills are backed up with biomass all the way back to the fermenter, the fruit juice. You know, the whole system is backed up as far back as it goes. Uh, and I've even taken all the fertilizer out of here and turned off this retriever by just saying uh, I require a high redstone signal which I'm not providing and therefore it's not going to provide any fertilizer and that way pretty much everything is turned off um, even uh, up here I can go take a look at these robots I flipped the switches to the down position for all three of them to recall them back to their positions uh, and this is mostly because I use sufficiently little power here that this guy is quite capable of providing all the power the house needs 
most of the time. It's just when I start getting to do something a little bit more out of the ordinary that uh, this is not enough. And that's a good place to be. So, I think that is caught up. Uh, mostly I've been focusing on decorations and gardening and uh, getting the outside of the house as uh, nicely appointed as the inside of the house. And um, not trying to be as focused on making everything useful. You know, everything at the old house was productive. You know, it was a garden. It was uh, a, a shed or an outbuilding or a power reactor. A lot of these are just fun uh, and just interesting decorations. So a lot more deco craft and a lot less agri craft. <laughs> uh, so I think I'm going to uh, take a swim in the pool and enjoy the sun and uh, wish you well. If you liked the video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hit subscribe if you want to know when the next one's coming out. And I will talk to you later.